So welcome to workshop number six, presented by me. And uh, I can see Ananda's joined us. He, he helps me each week with the QA, so I, I give him a bit of a shout out. Um, the sound bites were created, I forgot to mention this last week, were created by a local composer that I know, actually lived very close to Max, and Ananda knows her as well. I think Max, you might know it too, Hannah Silver. So oh, yeah, she I know put, her, yeah. She put th these together for me for a um, video tutorial I was going to do on photography years ago that I never got around to, so I thought I'd better use them. <laughs> After all, we're doing a video <laughs> photography tutorial. And we will be recording and posting to YouTube. So our program for today, welcome everybody. This is workshop number six. Uh, we've been going pretty well so far. So Anna's popped in now too. Uh, so today we're starting off with Max, or as he's known on Instagram and Connect, Max Plus Food. And then we'll be going on to a segment I'm calling Chasing the Light, which I'll explain a little more fully when we get there. Then we have a special guest who I'm very pleased to say has logged in and has probably given herself away because she's got a great big grin on her face. <laughs> oh, there's a couple of people with great big grins on their face. That's handy. Excellent. It's still a mystery. <laughs> and then we'll be doing our task. So first up from last week's tasks, the idea was to get 90 degrees onto a building so that you could see everything was nice and straight. Um, I'm not sure if Jason's actually here. Let me just have a really quick look because if he is, he might like to tell us about this. No, I don't think he's actually in the chat, unfortunately. That's okay. Hi, Paul. Uh, this is Jason. Oh, you are here. Excellent. <laughs> Would you like to tell us a little bit about your image, mate? Uh, yeah, actually, this is actually the uh, Red Fort uh, in Delhi. Uh, this is where um, our Prime Minister of India... Uh, um, Hoist the flag on uh, our uh, uh, Independence Day, um, but on a daily basis they have this uh, flag hoisted uh, on top of the uh, red fort, and it is taken from a, a distance. And I would I was trying to make it more uh, symmetrical on both sides. That way, uh, it is kind of same between, uh, and the flag is right in between the uh, picture as such. Uh, there was one more uh, which I have posted also, which is very near or just right under that. So in that, we, we can see that those uh, pillars were kind of converging uh, towards the uh, um, flag. Yeah, well, it's an awesome shot, and it demonstrates the technique that I was talking about perfectly. So Jason's got it 90 degrees to the building. You might remember we talked about beyond the T. So if, if the building is the T part, you stand on the long part of the tee and you stand down the bottom. So you take your shot at 90 degrees and you get a really nice straight outcome like that, which is perfect for maps. So now we're off to Max. So today's food photographer or pineapple or llama or whatever he ends up being, um, <laughs> will be talking to us about making food look exciting. Now, we've got two guest presenters doing food today, but the techniques that the two of you use are quite different. So I'm not worried at all that you'll cover the same ground or anything. So don't panic. <laughs> so this is Max standing outside a rainbow toasty shop, which is a particularly ridiculous place that he might like to explain when we get in there. But, um, <laughs> if you want to follow him on Instagram, he's Max Plus Food. Oh, sorry, Max Plus 360. Max plus 360. Uh-oh. Should I should I just fix that right now? Well, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, if you want. If you want. No, <laughs> let, let's fix it right now because people will see <laughs> these slides later. I thought you were Max plus food. I used to be. Ah. I'm, I'm not sure what I am on Connect. But I'm you're Max plus food, food on Connect, definitely. Okay. Um, Here we go. Thank you. Yeah. Because if I don't fix it now, I'll forget. And then people <laughs> will look at it later and go, who is this guy? Because anyway, yeah, just a spoiler alert for next week, I'll be talking about 360 photography because those are my two big passions for, for when it comes to photography. Um, I, I think that um, I think that the most important thing uh, when you're when you're do, doing food photography is you know you want to you're missing the scent. You can't people can't taste the food, so you want to capture it as best as possible so people feel like they're really tasting it. Um, and one of the greatest articles that really inspired me, I want to share, is the top, this this article from Snapsalance. 
I'm just going to share my screen here so I can share the article with you and just talk over some of the points um, because these tips I use all the time um, when when uh, when doing food photography. Um, uh, so natural light is always your friend. Um, um, and so using natural light can really make food look a lot more appetizing and a lot more tasty. So I'd always recommend using as much natural light as possible. Uh, this can be challenging if you're in an intimate, you know, romantic restaurant and you're just not going to get that good photos in that environment and you just need to, you know, accept that. But, um, and you can't use your flash in those restaurants because it's rude to all the other diners. I, I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> so um, natural light in the cafes is fantastic um, or in during the day. Um, the angle that you shoot is also super important. So you can see some examples here. Shooting from overhead um, ma makes it look really good, um, for, for especially for dishes like pizzas, um, you know, or um, that works really well. Um, dishes that don't work well overhead are sandwiches, uh, sandwiches or hamburgers or wraps. You need to get them on the side um, so you can see all the delicious ingredients. Um, so, like, here's a – here's a wait, let me show an overhead shot here. Uh, let's stop presenting, and I present my entire screen. Share. So this is an example of an overhead shot that I did in a restaurant in Melbourne. Um, and, you know, you can make some changes. Like I changed the burger. To, I opened up the burger so you could see all the ingredients. Uh, and, and I, uh, you know, so this, this makes it look more, more, more appealing. The salad looks appealing. So, yeah, this, if, you, if you think about how you can do it, I think you just did. Um, yeah, that, that, that can work really well. Another you know, course, stew, which no one can ever make look appealing. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, that the meatball that, that's tough. I, I, yeah, I had a, I think in that album, I have a on that day, I took another photo of that uh, stew that came off quite well. One thing you might notice there, Walter um, Max is looking for that shot, is he takes a lot of photos. <laughs> this was on Valentine's Day, which is why we have a kids photo. So this year, this was this was. Um, after I dropped one of the meatballs, <laughs> after I uh, after I after I started eating it, but actually made it made it for a better photo because it had some action, it had some some life to it, which is kind of funny. Um, yeah, so like uh, yeah, so it's always funny, you know. Sometimes your perfect photo you think is ruined, but actually it makes it more exciting or more interesting. And that image I then turned into uh, this Instagram story. <laughs> Shirt ruined. Um, so yeah. Um, now, now you know where the red shirt comes from. Yeah, <laughs> this is uh, this is another photo. This was shot at a sort of a side angle because I wanted to get the the burger to get all the fillings in the burger. But this dish here, uh, this the 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 um, salad bowl, you know, is a great top down shot. So um, I don't. I think these are my photos on Chapel Street. So go I'm using Google Photos. You can see the photos on Chapel Street. I'm, I'm going to lose that, but. Um, yeah, so that is that is another tip to to escalate your photos. Yeah, that's the same photo on an angle, and that one's top down. So it it that looks just looks a lot. The things look a lot better from the top down. If, and this dish is really composed really well, so it just looks very photography friendly. Um, now the number three is don't zoom, um, particularly if you're using an iPhone. This is you know if I'm. Uh, your, uh, you know, there's different levels of zoom, but it's um, if, as soon as you go from optical zoom to digital zoom, um, that really loses the quality. So on an iPhone, you, usually two times zoom is the maximum. Um, anything above that is digital zoom. And with Android, you you can if you look in your phone's manual, you'll be able to tell what's digital and what's optical. Always use optical zoom. Paul, have you ever had digital zoom and have you had a bad experience with digital zoom? Yeah, it can get very blocky and uh, quite a bit nasty. Mm, it, the, it gets, the, gets the pixel's a little bit handy because it has got real zoom to an extent. Yeah. Oh, so how many times zoom has the pixel got? I can't actually remember, to be honest. But I know it, it has um, got a real zoom in it. I think the current iPhone cool. does too. The current iPhone, it, it doesn't. It has two, it has two lenses. Yeah, it's one at... 
so it, it's not actual zoom it's just a it's a it's a, a wider lens um but it does feel on when you use the but it looks like it's zoom on the on the iphone when yeah um so the other thing i really recommend is that if you if you have those grid lines you can actually also put grid lines on your phone and so grid lines help you compose the shot better so if you have the option for grid lines most phones have them you should put them on um number five is pick a simple neutral background um so that's always good if you don't want your background to be too colorful or too distracting you want the focus to be on the food so if you see on these ones here that plain wood is is great because it just sets the makes the food look a lot better. I, I know someone who Excuse actually me. carries a um, printed background, which is wood that they take oh, really? in places and put the food on it. Yeah, that's amazing. It would get a bit repetitive though, but it, it's still a great idea. Um, garnishing your food always helps. So if there's some if there's some nice salt on the table, some nice herbs. Um, if you're making food at home. Always, you want to garnish it with some nice, nice herbs because um, they just give it. They just make it pop. Um, experimenting with plating is really good. You know, getting, um, you know, if, if if it's a salad, you know, make sure you, make sure that all of, you've got some of the salad ingredients represented on the top. You got to toss that salad good um, to get that, to get that salad out there. Unless it's like a really like a very manicured layered salad, like you can see on this one here. Um, uh, yeah, you want to put some props in it, in it and that looks good. That will elevate your game. Um, hands are always great. Um, you know, if, if you're holding a hot dog, hot dogs work great with ha with um with hands. Um, it just just makes it sh gets that alive. It just yeah. Um, uh, this one's a great one. Uh, so you want to you want to. It's great to use an Instagram filter. Uh, that, that Instagram filters are great um, to just give it a bit more of a different look, but you don't want to give it too much. Um, so I always find that like 10 to 20 between there is a speed spot if you're using Instagram filter. Anything more, it'll just be like <clears throat> too much. You'll look like a crazy pineapple. Um, you want it to look natural. Um, and the final one, shoot up close. I mean, you can see how much more delicious those dishes look when you're really getting close. So I always recommend trying to get in as close as possible so you can see the details of the food. Um, you know, yeah, always, always try and get, yeah, always try and get in close so you can really see all the, you know, the, the sauce. You can see the, well, you can't see the crab because it's hidden. You, know, you always want to get in close so you can see the full dish. Um, yeah, let me, this is, yeah, these ones here, you know, the pokey bowls, um, the closer you are, the better, the better it will look. Um, I don't take that many ones far away. Um, yeah. Um, and so that's my tips, but you know, I'm going to open up to the audience. It's not just about me. I want to know, um, put in the comment in the chat. What are your, what are your top tips for taking great food photography? Because I, I'd like to know what your tips are. Um, let me just see if I got any comments here. Oh yeah, not yet. Um, but Apparently put, put comments in there. Hungry. <laughs> Who's hungry? Hands up if you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's my that's my tips. Um, and yeah, so and if you wanna if you wanna if you wanna learn more about see more of my 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 photography, you can go to you can always check it out on my Instagram or on my. Uh, for food stuff, check. You can. I always put all my food photos on maxplusfood.com as well. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> and you stick them on another evil commercial site, but we won't mention that since this is local guides. <laughs> what, what do I put them on? What Facebook? Aren't you putting them on Liven? Oh no, I just that's um no I I. That's another thing. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> 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 they don't have like a social media app though. No, they will one day. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks very much for that, Max. So if people want to put um, food tips in during the evening into the chat, that's uh, more than welcome to do that. And we can have a look at those towards the end and maybe get Max in for a bit more of a chat with those. Uh, I just want to, i got to reflect on a couple of them that are coming in. Uh, Adrian says his tip is try to take photos before eating. <laughs> 
Yeah, that generally is a good <laughs> idea. Although I've been known to take photos of a burger with a great big bite out of it because you can often see more in it. <laughs> That's very true, yeah. Um, and um, uh, likes my shirt. Somebody says, I laugh. That crazy's talking about my watermelon shirt. Yeah, that's a good one. I do like that. That's a. I, this was on a, a, lo a local guides made up tour that I did with Paul, and I wore this pineapple shirt because I just thought it'd be fun. <laughs> and Falguni Paleja says using natural light. Yeah, that's really that's really really good. Very wise. Um, and Sri Barai says coriander leaves on top. That's a good point. Coriander leaves really do make. Uh, do do make uh do make it look a lot better. So perhaps we should all carry some coriander or some continental parsley in our pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that would work. Ananda says ice cream never looks as good after you've licked it. Ice cream's really tough to photograph. Um, <laughs> it's it melts really quickly. You've got to be um either be in a cold environment, but you've got to be quick. It's challenging. Yeah, you certainly don't want to wait too long. <laughs> How would you shoot these, Max? What are they? Lollies. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> I'm, you know, it's funny. I've, I've seen a lot of people do some really funny arrangements with um, lolly, animal lollies, like to make them look like real dinosaurs and stuff and make them look like real, um, look like a real snake pit and stuff. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. We might as well move on with the rest of it. So thanks a lot to Max, and we'll Thank get into you. the next segment. So this one's about chasing the light. So I'll be talking about things like the position of the light, where where it should be, generally speaking. And just remember, when I'm talking about something, if I use the word rule, um, a rule is really a guideline in photography. I'd certainly suggest when you're starting out that you follow the rules or guidelines. But as your skills develop and as you start to understand what happens, experiment. So if I say shoot and don't shoot into the sun, absolutely you should because you need to learn what it does. You need to learn what the, what the effects are and how you can use that creatively. We'll talk about the time of day because I don't know how many of you have noticed, but the, the time of day that you take a photo can make that image dramatically different. You could stay in one place for a, a 20 hour period and you'll get a series of very, very different images that probably won't even look like the same place. I'll talk about too much light versus not enough light. That's always a challenging one, particularly in digital. In film, it can be a little bit easier to recover from not enough light. No one can really recover from too much light. But in digital, it, it's a little bit harsher. And I'll be talking about soft light and hard light and the difference there. So. The first tip I'm going to give you is during the day, just as a, a general rule, try and have the sun behind you or at least to one side of you when you're taking a photo of something. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is. It will look better if the sun's behind you because you end up generally with a nice blue sky. Your sky and your ground will have a similar sort of exposure level and you'll not have to resort to tricks. So by tricks, I'm just going to show you this thing. I hope you can see this. If I put it right in front of my head, you'll probably be able to see it. So you notice that the top half of this is gray and the bottom half's not. That's called a, a graduated neutral density filter. You can use that in situations where the sky is too bright. So I'm not expecting you all to go out and buy those things. It's just a, a thing that I use when I'm cheating a little bit. But if you keep the sun behind you, you won't, you won't need something like that. You'll just be able to shoot this sort of image, which was just straight onto New York from a ferry boat coming back from Statue of Liberty, I think, from memory. And you get nice warm colours along with the, the blue sky. And you get lots of detail in the photo because there's lots of light. And one of the things digital cameras love is lots of light. So remember I talked about the time of the day before? So the sun changes angle throughout the entire day. And I'll get into winter and summer a little bit later because there is a huge difference between the two. But you start off with pre-dawn light. So that's that lovely sort of deep blue, almost purple colours. And then you get into sunrise where you get really vibrant reds and oranges if you're facing towards the sun. And away from the sun, you'll probably get pinks and purples and blues and all sorts of interesting colours. They can happen facing the sun as well, but 
you might not see it so much because the sun's so bright. Then you get into what's called the golden hour. And I'll give examples of each of these things shortly. And the golden hour is the time that people love to go out and shoot people because it's really good to take people out into the landscape and take pictures of them in that time. The one thing that you want to watch is your compute, your camera will probably confuse the white balance during the golden hour, but you can fix that later on when you come back, particularly if you're shooting raw. I don't recommend that you change your white balance to anything in particular when you're shooting in the golden hour because um, it's pretty hard to guess what you should actually use. If you do want to do that, set it into a manual one, use the live view on your camera if it supports it, and just see what it looks like and try and get a, a color balance that looks similar to what's around you. Then we get into daytime. Now, early in the day, daytime's fine. But when you get towards the middle of the day, when the sun's at its highest point in the sky, daytime is a bit yuck. It's a bit hard to see anything. You get very, very strong, harsh shadows. And if you're shooting things like buildings or trees or people, um, you'll end up with shadows in strange places that make them look quite different. Now, for maps purposes, would you not take a photo of a building that you want to put onto maps in the middle of the day? No, of course not, because it's not going to matter that much for maps. You don't have to be artistically creative or artistically perfect for it. But for your other sorts of shots that you're taking for yourself, you, it's worth thinking about avoiding it if you can. So if you're traveling, you probably haven't got a choice. But if you could go there at a different time of day, I would suggest that you should. And guess what happens at the other end of the day? Same thing, except it goes the other way. So you head back from daytime in the late afternoon and early evening, usually fairly nice light to shoot with, except perhaps in the middle of summer, but we'll get into that lately, later. Uh, then you get into the golden hour again. Now, the golden hour in the afternoon, same name as the golden hour in the morning. The light's a little bit different, though, and doesn't make that much difference to your shots, but just be aware of it. Now, if you're trying to find out when these times are, there's a lot of apps out there. My favorite one is called the Photographer's Ephemeris, which is TPE. So if you Google TPE in your app store or on websites, then you'll find that. And that tells you not only when the sunset and sunrise happen and all of the other time frames, but it also tells you what direction the sun's going to come from. Now, then we get into sunset. You can get some amazing colors in sunset. Very similar to the ones you got in the morning. Surprise. <laughs> And then you get into twilight, which is fairly similar to the pre-dawn. Um, and depending on the time of year, the twilight can last quite a long time. There's also two twilights. There's the normal twilight and one called nautical twilight. So nautical twilight is when the sun has well and truly gone behind the horizon. And the normal twilight is just as it goes behind the horizon. I assume it makes a difference if you're on a ship. It's probably the name. Now, pre-dawn and twilight, you can treat them fairly similarly. They're both a very soft light. You'll get lots of blues and purples in your shots. The colors are very pastel-like, so they're very gentle colors. Um, you probably get no shadows at all. And you'll have low light levels, so you'll need to do generally a long exposure. Now, this can work really well if you're down at the beach or something like that, because you can do some amazing things with long exposures with water. In this particular example, and I'm sure Ollie's probably going a bit crazy right now because maybe he recognizes where this is. This is a place called Nugget Point in Queenstown. And this was the view from my hotel that um, I have to thank the person over there, my wife, for booking because it was bloody awesome. And we, we woke up to this view every day. But this is actually pre-dawn. I know it looks like the sun's up, but that's just the beauty of overexposing a shot in a digital camera. So there's nice greens and blues in this shot. There's no shadows at all. And it's a nice long exposure. So that river, which is actually quite a violent river, the shot over river, if you've all, well, I don't know if you've all seen them, but a lot of people have probably seen those jet boats that go hooning up and down that river. Um, they went right past our hotel and it's quite a violent rapid river. Then we get into the twilight and this is from the same place. So the light's slightly different because I've exposed a little bit differently, not as long. It's also become cloudy at that time. It snowed that night. So you're getting some nice mists in the valley there because the cold air is starting to settle. And whenever you're around water, you'll often get mists when the cold air comes. And you'll see there's a lot more um, yellowy and red tones in the trees immediately outside the hotel. That's probably the light from the hotel rooms affecting that. So you wouldn't normally see that at that time because you can't see that in the other trees in the background. 
Now, again, no shadows, and again, it's a long exposure. So when I'm talking about a long exposure, these would, I didn't actually look at the metadata on these, but these would have been more than 20 seconds. So you're gonna need a tripod. Um, you're probably not gonna be able to do it with a phone, although I've seen some recently that seem to be getting quite good at long exposure, but they're still not good at stabilization. So you still need something to hold on to it. And we get into sunrise and sunset. So sunrise, you start with soft light and it becomes harder. Sunset, you start with hard light and it becomes softer. So I know that's a little bit hard to visualize. And the best thing I can suggest you do is at sunset, um, actually take some pictures and just take, make every three to five minutes or so, take a picture of something and just look at the progression. So I'll, I'll leave you guys to do that. You'll get lots of oranges and reds. You'll get quite long shadows that you need to keep an eye on and you'll see why in a moment. Um, and a big difference between lit and unlit areas. And that's where these beasts, that gray thing I showed you before can come in handy because what that's for, you put the gray across the really bright area and you put the clear part against the, the darker area and it just helps even it out a little bit so your camera can cope with it better. And you get some amazing sky colors. Not always, but often. So at sunrise, in this particular shot, the sun's coming up off to the side. This is Lake Wakatipu in New Zealand. It's very near Queenstown. So you see lots of beautiful reds and orange hues. And in this particular case, the sun's hit the mountains, but it hasn't hit the water yet. So it's lighting up from behind the hill on the left-hand side. So you can see the distant mountains are getting quite nicely lit up. But there's still enough light to get lots of structure and you're getting some nice reflections of the sky and the clouds in the water. Um, sadly, it wasn't a particularly still day or it would have been even better. And I'm gonna show you a couple of sunset shots. This first one is shooting into the sun. Remember I said, don't do that? I do it all the time. <laughs> it actually yields quite nice effects. Um, you can get some very interesting lens flares. You can see a bit of a halo. In fact, you can see three lines of halo to the left of the sun. There's a very bright one, then there's a faint one, and then there's a, a more wishy-washy one around to the side. But you can also see what the sun's doing to the distant mountains. You can see the quite strong yellow light on the fire tower, and you can see how it's highlighting the leaves, which I quite like. It does mean that the rest of the image goes quite dark, though. Don't go home after the sun has set. So this is a good half hour from the same place after the sun set. The fire tower is off to the right in this shot. Um, and you can see that you've got all these nice blues and purples and, and you're starting to get blacks coming through in the mountains. And you can get some really cool layered effects here. Now these shots are, are nice by themselves. I really like this sort of landscape shot but they can also be useful for backgrounds if you're doing portrait photos and things like that that you can use as your background for the, the people. And we've got golden hour. So this is approximately an hour after sunrise and an hour before sunset. And I say approximately because it really depends where you are in the world. I and mean, some of you are in the tropics, you're near the equator, it's gonna be quite different for you how long that time period is. Um, I think it's the further away you are from the equator, the longer it is from memory, but not 100% sure on that one. But the light gets, the light is usually softer during that time. Uh, you've got very warm, natural colours happening, long, long, long shadows, and it's really great for photographing people, food and structures. So if you're sitting in an outdoor cafe during golden hour, you'll get some very different shots to what you would during the day. And I said it's great for people and sun and landscapes. This is a um, a bride who's being photographed on the the mountains of New Zealand. It's um, near Skippers Point. It's one of those interesting places. If you try and go there, there's this massive signs that says if you're driving a rental car, turn around now because you don't have insurance anymore. You go anyway. <laughs> don't tell anyone. So, but you've got to watch those shadows. So you can see some shadows on her gown that are happening in there but you can also see the shadows starting to appear on the landscape in the background which make the landscape look quite different but you can also see that there's very very warm tones in the hour immediately after sunrise it's a little bit different 
So you get some nice warm colours like we got here, a deep blue sky, if it's not cloudy, and you get great structure in your images. So what do I mean by structure? In this image, because you've got quite a lot of light, the camera is doing a really good job at discerning all those individual leaves and discerning the wires in the bridge. And the wires are all lit up by the sun. So you can see on one side, they're quite bright and the other side, they're quite dark. So it gives you this really nice contrast that makes them easy to see. So you've probably seen lots of photos of the Brooklyn Bridge. If the, the people that took them went there at this time of day, they'd be much happier with the shots that they take at, at 12 o'clock or one o'clock in the afternoon. Now, daytime. So this is both after the golden hour and before the golden hour again. Uh, so you'll get the soft tending towards hard and then back to soft light. You get tend to get high contrast and hard shadows and natural colors, but too much light can wash out the features, particularly in the sky. And you, the morning and afternoons are the best times for the photography then, avoid during the day. You should go inside and have some nice lunch somewhere. So some of you probably recognize this person. It's um, Tracy Capiello, who's <laughs> one of the people who runs Local Guides and, and runs Connect for us. And I was fortunate enough to go and have breakfast with her one day in Brooklyn. Um, it's great light for people. So you, you can see it, it's quite kind to both of us. I mean, I'm kind of old and craggy. And in that photo, I don't look that old and craggy anymore. Uh, but you've got to watch those shadows. You notice that's a selfie with the phone. And what's on my face? Shadow from the phone. Did I even notice at that time? Yeah. And to be honest, in that sort of shot, I don't really care because it's capturing a moment with a friend. It's not, not needing an important New York shot or whatever. But because the sun's so bright, I am a bit squinty. So you need to watch that if you're shooting people. It's difficult for a person to look into the sun while you're taking their picture, even though their picture will be better when they're looking into the sun. You have to think of their comfort. Now, lunchtime. So if you're taking shots at midday, and if you're traveling overseas, you probably can't avoid this. So on this particular day, we we're in Central Park. Um, I wanted to take a picture of the Ghostbusters building across the lake, because, you know, good movie. Watch it if you haven't. The original, the others are crap. Um, just got someone joining us late. So midday does give you kind of boring images. You notice there's almost no tone in that building. There's not a lot of contrast. There's not much structure there. You can discern that the building's there. You can see some shapes and things like that, but you can't make out individual bricks or anything like that in the shot. And the sky's quite washed out. So you, you might remember that shot I showed you of the bridge earlier in the morning, actually, I'm going forwards, I want to go backwards, that one, that sky was really bright. It's the same day, it's only a couple of hours later, and we get that one. So that's purely because of the height of the, the sun in the sky. Winter time is quite different. So winter time, you can get away with shooting at midday normally, most of the time. So this was about May, so it's certainly approaching winter, and it's it's more like a summer morning because the sun's really low in the sky. If you remember that diagram I had with the sun going over the top, it never really makes it to the top of the sky so much because it's lower down. You still get that nice deep blue sky that you get in the mornings, usually, and you get nice warm tones, but you still get the, the long shadows that that time of day can give you. So this is a steamboat that's on Lake Wakatipu in New Zealand encourage you to ride it if you go there. It's an awesome experience. It's probably one of the fastest steamboats I've ever been on. Now, when we talked about daytime, we're talking about really harsh light. An overcast day can eliminate that to some extent. So an overcast day, you can still end up with nice, softer and more even light. Um, <clears throat> I'll cut this bit out of the video later when I've got a frog in my throat. But on the overcast days, you can get uh, a softer, more even light. You get much lower contrast, natural colours. You may not get any shadows at all, or they may be very soft if you are getting them. And almost any time during the day on an overcast day is fine for photography. The one thing you'll have to watch is that you do have less light. So you, you need to try and do other things to keep your shutter speed up. So you remember um, last week we talked about increasing your ISO so that you can have more sensitivity on the sensor. 
you may need to do that on an overcast day if you want to stop things moving and stop action. I don't know if you can see Busy in the background, but she's, I think she's about to cough something up on the carpet. So overcast days are awesome for uh, shooting shots of people. So this was the New York 36 walk, which was nearly all Googlers came to this and one local guide. <laughs> uh, so you can see that all of the people are lit quite evenly, even the two of us wearing hats, but you get a really boring sky and there's quite low contrast in the image. So the people stand out quite nicely, but the things behind them don't look so good. But that can be handy with portraits because you want to distract people away from the background because you want them to look at the people. They are, overcast days are very good for things like street art and for picking up the color on buildings. So in this shot, there's, this was at about 11.30, 12 o'clock. Um, there's nice even light right throughout the whole scene. There's almost no contrast. There's almost no shadows. And you get lots of nice natural colors coming through in the flowers and the, the growth that's there and the street art that's erected in that particular place. So that's a place called the High Line in New York. So if you ever go to that city, walk the High Line. It's a, a really different experience to the rest of the city. And now I can reveal who our other special guest is. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. <laughs> Adrian's going crazy. I will <laughs> stop presenting. So Jesse is on Connect as Jesse, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and on Instagram is Jesse Litch. So I thought I'd invite Jesse along and she felt that she'd be happy to talk about food and I've seen some of her food photos and how seriously she takes it. And I thought, what an awesome opportunity. So I'll stop presenting now and hand it over to you. Okay, can you see it? Uh, not right. yet, but we, we can see and hear you, which is a good start. <laughs> It'll come. You can now, right? Yes, we can see now. Oh, great. Uh, so food photography is the kind of photography I like the most and the way I started contributing to maps. And over the years, and thanks to articles on Connect, I learned and figured out some things that I will talk to you about today. So the main topics that I will talk about are camera modes for when you're using your phone, lighting, so the difference between each kind and which kind of lighting you should look for, which Max already talked about and Paul too. Uh, styling, which is about the composition of the photo and more. And the last point is about how much information the photo gives the viewer. So how useful is it for maps, users and other people who see it. So the first topic is camera modes. I usually use the regular camera or either of these two, depending on the situation or the individual photo. Uh, portrait mode makes the photo focus on one element and blurs the background. So I usually use it when there's nothing interesting on the background or I want to take a photo of just one plate and I want it to really stand out. I know some phones have full mode, which is pretty much the same, I think. Um, night mode is also great for when, to, when, when you want the photo to be more detailed and it's too dark or the lighting isn't good enough. So we're talking about lighting, it isn't great in any of these photos. <laughs> and the first photo in the left is taken with night mode, but the light is, is coming from the other side, so it doesn't help that much. Uh, the photo next to it is taken with flash, and the photo in the right is taken with artificial lights. I try to avoid using flash and our sort of artificial lights because it can make the food look flat and less appetizing than natural light.
as you can see on the photos in the right, there is a big difference between taking a photo of the same thing on the shadows and in the sunlight. The best lighting you can have is the sunlight or natural light. It makes the food look a lot more natural, colorful, and appetizing. If you look at the photo of me holding the waffle in the, on the plastic cup, you can see that the sunlight makes it look a lot better and even the background improved. But there is a shadow in the middle from the fork and I'm also hiding the sticker with the name of the business, so it isn't perfect. And that leads us to the next topic, which is styling. So when you get your food on the table, it might not look nice. Uh, so you might want to move the food in the table or also change how everything is laid out. The first thing I usually do is put everything we ordered closer in the quickest and nicest way I can so it fits into one shot. And when I'm done with that, I start taking more detailed photos to my food. I say the quickest because other people had to wait while you do that and they usually don't enjoy it. <laughs> I see the try different angles. You've just made an ender a very happy man because that's what he's always saying to me. Try more angles, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I should. I actually took it from the top because I really liked uh, circles. Being two circles there, it seemed very symmetrical. But then I took it from the angle, I, and I thought that it showed more. It showed better the texture and everything. So it looks completely different to me. So yeah, different. Uh, definitely try different angles and because you might find a better one. Uh, a photo that shows one dish might not look as interesting, so you can take the photo from a side and an, an angle that lets more things into the shot, and so gives more information about the business. And you might want to take it from different sides too, so you can try different backgrounds and different lights. What I like to do the most when it's a type of food you normally eat with your hands is to take a photo grabbing it with one hand. And you can get it close to the camera for more detail and for people to focus more on it. Or you can use the background more. When you grab it with your hand, it has a human element which lets people connect with the photo and also can help them figure out how big is the portion. And like Paul likes, you can bite it <laughs> or inspect it. So while you grab it, after you, you are sure you have taken all the photos you want, Adrian, <laughs> you can bite it and take photos again. This is a human element again, even without your hand, and lets people see how the food is really like and see clearly what the ingredients are. And instead of biting it, you can also move the food a bit and it shows more ingredients. Another thing I always do uh, in meetups, especially because we always eat at some point, is to take a photo of everything we ate. I ask everyone to put the drinks or food in the middle and take a photo. So you aren't able to think a lot about angles or anything really because it is pretty quick. But I think they are very helpful and also fun to do. The first thing good about it is that it shows a lot of different things you can get in the business. Plus, there are always people who have taken a bite already or maybe are almost finishing it. So you can get the same people, same product in different states. And again, it helps people understand what it is like. And you're also showing that the business is a fun place to go with groups. This tip is just about making sure you take one photo that showcases the best thing about the food or drink 
it could be the melted cheese, chocolate sauce, or anything people or you like the most about it. And the next time, final tip is to just apply what you know. So all the Paul talked us in the previous workshops can still be done with food photography. Uh, you can fill the frame shot, shots, uh, show a lot of detail, and the leading lines are great to make sure the focus is on the food. And that's it. So what we had to do this week is taking two food photos <laughs> with everything we have learned so far. Yep, that's it. <laughs> So thanks heaps for putting all that effort in there, Jess. I do like your food photos and I know you put so much effort into it and they come out really nicely. Thank you. <laughs> so Jesse is also a, a moderator on Connect. I'll put you on the spot. Do you want to talk about that briefly? <laughs> um, yeah, I've been a moderator for almost a year, I think it's it's great and it allowed me to get to know the platform and everything better. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I'm just stalling here because I haven't shared their photo album yet. <laughs> I normally put a link in the presentation, but I completely forgot. So I've just gone off to find the photo album so I can share it. So what are your favorite things about taking food photos of people in groups? Sorry, I was reading the comments. <laughs> Can you repeat that? <laughs> What's your favorite thing about taking food photos in groups? I think it's a nice moment, especially because you are almost eating and you tell everyone, hey, a group photo and everyone is kind of, oh no, I already ate. I already took a bite or whatever. And it's just, it's funny and yeah. And then it's funny people yelling at you because you are taking too long. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I know that feeling. Uh, so, does, so does Max. Whoops. Copied someone's name instead of copying the link there. That's Would it be okay really to want. ask a quick question? Yeah, go. Yeah, Jessica. Um, I just wondered when you said before when you use portrait mode for the mm -hmm. photographs, does that then blur the background if it's far away and focus on the food? Yeah, exactly. So it blurs the background and it also gives a little bit of zoom, I think. Okay. So yeah, it just focuses a lot on the food and and really helps with that. Thank you. So you use portrait most of the time? Uh, only when I don't want the background to, to show up. Only when I'm taking like only a photo of a specific thing. Okay. Otherwise, what do you use? Um, regular camera or night mode. The thing about night mode is that it brings a lot of contrast, which I don't usually like <laughs> because it makes the food look very like hard and I don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the other thing night mode can do is make the exposure take a little bit longer so you can get slightly blurry images out from it if you're not holding it really still. And if you're anything like me, I can't hold things still. <laughs> cool. So does anybody have any questions about their tasks this week? So the idea is to take a couple of food photos. Now, I know a lot of you are, are still trapped at home because you aren't able to go out. Um, Victorians where I live, we're lucky enough to be able to go out and about. And I have been over the last couple of days. I've even tried to get an Ander to go out, but he won't yet. <laughs> um, are you going to come tomorrow? See, I'm putting him on the spot now. <laughs> we, we've got our first after lockdown local guides meetup tomorrow. I'm deliberately keeping it very small, though, so I haven't announced an official meetup for it because I don't want <clears throat> lots of people to turn up for obvious reasons. So it's just a few friends that know each other. But what, I, what I'd like you to do is to take two food photos. Now, it's up to you how you take them. So. Think about the things that Jess and Max have said around styling and arranging and using light. Um, have a think about how to make the, the food look its best. 
And if you're taking a picture at home, I'm not asking you to sit down and make a, a restaurant quality dish, just whatever you happen to be eating, use that. And I think that um, you'll probably enjoy the experience and just pop a couple of photos into the album. And as usual, we'll choose our favorites next week and I'll, I'll probably share the album with um, Max and Jess and they can have a hand in choosing the favorite ones. So has anybody got any questions? Because we've come to that part of the evening. Nope. Yeah, right. Paul and Lego. You're going to ask me about Lego again, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Uh, though it's funny part, but however, this is very true. Couple of advertising. Oh, you made me quiet. <laughs> great, great, great. Just for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really touched. Keep one more for next time. However, this time I have got one question for you. I mean, this. Oh, wow, wow, wow. wow. One more. <laughs> <laughs> you anyway, put all what... the picture and send me and share me a link, Pa. <laughs> um, if you have a look on Instagram, if you use it, look at Drop Bear Paul Bricks. That's got my Lego photos. I'll put it in the thing. No, you keep one in uh, your album and just put a link. I will go through all the journey one by one. Oh, there's Not tens the of thousands of them. <laughs> but anyway, what's your question, Anil? I'm coming with to the questions of the food. You know, food stops and all the photography, what we are taking, couple of that, they are not coming that much of shininess, sparkling. However, couple of advertising, Advisor, I mean, advertisers, though, used to take the pictures, though they used to make some artificial stuff I know for sparkling and all, for giving them contrast and shiny look, which that is not coming with our photographs. That's because the people who are doing advertising shots for photographs surround that food, which is probably well and truly cold, and they surround it with $10,000 worth of lighting equipment and a photography team and spend a lot of time getting the shots right. Whereas we're there, we're there to have a meal and we've got a phone usually. So our shots will be a little bit different. Um, you may even find that the, the food that they're using for their advertising photos isn't actually even food. It's often made of plastic or it's made of epoxy and it's made exactly. very carefully to look exactly. like food. Right. That's what I was saying. Exactly. Something like that. Yeah. It's sneaky tricks. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Cool. Any other questions? And can I also add? Sanya? Can I also add what you just said? I just want to add uh, to what he just said about photography. Yeah. I want to add to what you just said about uh, advertising. Yeah, photography. please do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I've been in advertising for quite a while. So I just want to add that even apart from all the lighting and all the props, um, there are still some after shoot um, editing thing that I've done uh, with Photoshop, trying to you know, blend the light, uh, reduce the contrast and all that. So it's not just photo taking um, right away from the camera. So there are a lot of you know, editing done right after the shot I, uh, I've been taking. So that's what I like to say. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. In any professional photo shoot, whether it be a dish of food or a, a product for a store or something like that, there, there's not one person involved. There's a whole creative team. And that one shot that you see turning up in a magazine or turning up on a poster, that's probably a week or more of work for that team. So they're not, not instant quick things. And, and that's why their shots are quite so different. And as Sanya says, there's all of the editing that goes along behind the scenes. I'm not brilliant at editing. I tend to, to play and dabble and eventually I find something I like and then I'm happy and I post it. But 
um, there are people with some really, really incredible skills. Particularly, Photoshop's probably the, the most used tool that I'm aware of. And the people who have those skills are very, very valuable people in the industry. And they they tend to get paid pretty well. Better than the photographers, usually. <laughs> Hi, Ms. Boyd. Uh, can, I, can I add a, a point? Of course. Yeah. So I'm just pasting it. Thanks, so This is regarding the uh, blue hours. Um, you know, that is post golden hours, uh, mm -hmm. the blue hours, uh, which, well, I think uh, you will cover in some of the times. Thank yeah, you all. That post sunset shot was really blue hour, that one I showed before. Let me go and find it and I'll present the screen again. Uh, that one. So I'll just start this back up and I'll present the screen. Yes, usually bluish tint will be more over. Yeah, absolutely. So what Traveller G is talking about, I should find out your real name one day because I doubt it's Traveller. <laughs> but uh, what Traveller G is talking about is the, the blue light that you see in, in the images in the blue hour. So in this one, there's still some light from the sun in the sky because even though it, it's well and truly behind the horizon, the sky stays lit up for a really, really long time after the sun goes down. You may not see it yourself that much, but your camera will, it's particularly with a longer exposure. And the the really nice blues that you get are really kind to landscapes. So if you're looking at something that's got some undulations like these mountains, you end up with these really nice layers that give you the impression of depth. And you can travel through the photograph from the front towards the back. Excellent that, comments. Yeah. Excellent and, comments. Thank you. And that really only happens during the blue hour. The rest of the time, you can certainly see the landscape. But I, I personally never really get that feeling of a journey when I'm looking at an image, except if it's been taken at this time. But with modern cameras, you know, we can do some good job. Oh, definitely. The world's changed a lot. Um, in, interestingly, the makeup of your sensor can affect how much blue light it sees. Now, Sony sensors love blue light always have done right since the beginning of Sony sensors. So any camera using the Sony sensors um, will often pick up blues more than it picks up reds. And other cameras are similar. They have a, they, they tend to have a favorite color that they like more than the others. Likes is not a good word for it, but it's probably the simplest way to describe it. Um, I think the, the Olympus tends to like a little bit of, of reds. It struggles with blue sometimes, um, particularly if it's really, really bright blue. I won't show you the images, but I did a, a model shoot where the the figure was lit very intensely from both sides, one with a really strong red light and one the other with a really strong blue light. And I could not photograph this person because my sensor just couldn't cope with it. And I had to wait until after that section had been done and use the model a different way while the other people shot in that workshop. So Great. Get to, thank you. Get, yeah, get to know what your camera can do. And the best way to do that is do it. Just play. Play with all the different modes. Learn what they do. Forget about the book. Just go and play. Does oh, Olympus 130 have a Sony does. sensor? Olympus 130 is having Sony sensor? Uh, which Olympus 130? I'm not sure. Olympic 100 is to the new Olympus, Olympus camera, 100 into 30. Does it have a Sony sensor? As what Paul is mentioning now? Um, the model, uh, do you know the model, Paul? No, that's what we're going to need to find out. Olympus 100 is to 30, 100 is to 30. I'm just trying to Google it for you. That, that is there in your table, Paul. That is there in our table. Oh, so no, that's a, that's a lens. Them. Sorry. No, the lenses don't have sensors. It's the camera body that has the sensor. Sony sensor um, or simple sensor? Mine definitely does not have a Sony sensor in it, no. 
it's had the same sensor from Olympus for a very long time. They haven't come out with a new one for ages. I kind of wish they would. <laughs> uh, Paul, is... yes. I have a question for you. Yeah, go. Uh, actually, the today's session was very interesting. Like pool photography is the most lovable, love, loved part of Google Maps. Like we tend to put food photos on maps so that people get to know about the places. But the problem which we face here is due to the lighting. So when is it appropriate to use a flashlight on photographs and when you should not use the flashlight? So how would you understand what to do? Um, I try not to use flash at all. I think Jess mentioned that and I think Max mentioned that as well. If you find you're in a really low light situation, I'm not sure if you came to the first session, but I'll just demonstrate. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. The use with the soft towel and the flashlight one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if you illuminate something, let's let's take the rabbit as an example. So if I'm illum illuminating the rabbit directly with the light, it's quite bright. Yeah. But if I go through the piece of paper, it's quite different. It's softer. So that can help you in a really dark restaurant it can be really difficult there's no really easy answer there yeah but due to the photo uh, details are hidden most of the times if we go with the softer light so how to actually get the food photo with the proper details at that moment the the best way you're going to be able to do it is to bring your own light along um i i don't suggest you bring one of these but <laughs> it, this is a, a big video light that um, i i tend to use these things this is an yeah. incredibly bright light if i turn this thing on you won't be able to look at it but um there's little tiny ones of these available that would fit in a bag easily well, they're, they're oh. about this big they're about the size of a phone you can even get ones that are powered by the phone so you okay. can plug them into the USB port on the phone. Um, those ones can be quite useful. If you do get something like that, um, make sure it's a fairly warm light because the what I'm talking about there is if you're using modern LED lighting, um, that one yeah. I can control it and I can control what's called the color temperature. And you can take it from cold, which is a bright white with a lot of blue, through to, to warm, which has got more yellows and more reds. And for food, you generally want a warmer light. It makes the food look nicer. Okay, the ring lights also are coming with the LED ones, which are which alters the color. So that could be helpful. Yeah, you can definitely use the, a ring light. Um, what you can do, it's a little bit difficult with the phone. Some of them support white balance these days. But if yeah. you're using a, a ring light, they tend to be very blue. So if you can change the white balance in this your phone, phone camera, Yep. If yeah. you can change the white balance in your phone camera, tell it to use the white balance for a flash and just oh. see if that, that might warm it up and make it look a little bit better. If it doesn't, you can always take some um, clear yellow or orange or red plastic to shine that through. So it doesn't want to, it wants to be a very light shade. So not really deep red or anything like that, but that will help it warm it up as well. Yeah, that's a good tip. Thanks, Paul. No worries. Um, I saw uh, Paul, in, can in... we use this ring light? Yeah, of course you can. You can use anything you want. It's okay. entirely up to you. Yeah. <laughs> One of the... uh, I, saw, I was just going to have a look in the chat because there's some questions in the chat and then I'll come back to the group again. Yeah. Um, Iwadi's asked in the two food photos, which should be the first and which the second. That's up to you. So just two food photos think about how you want to arrange them and light them. So do your, put your best ones in. Uh, Falguni asked, what's the best way to capture food that's kept in trays? And in India, there's a lot of street food that's kept open in a tray for a while before it goes on into display. So should we take from close up or from the top or the side? Um, to me, that would depend on whether the tray is reflective or not and whether it's well lit or not. So if the tray is reflective, find an angle where it's not shining light straight into your camera or into your phone. Um, for the, the tray food, I try to get in close. So if it's a bit of a mound of food, 
try and get in close and, and show the mound of food a little bit like a hill, as though it was a landscape, because it'll just seem more natural that way. I'm just having a quick more run through here. I hope that makes sense, Falguni. Uh, what else have we got today? Uh, Bandana said she needs to head out because her niece is there. There we go. And we've got a question. When are we talking about 360 photos? That's actually next week. So Max is going to talk about 360 photos for inside places like restaurants and shops and things like that. And it's um, one of the things, Max is a in the Street View trusted photographer program, so am I. It's a little bit connected to local guides, but it's a little bit not connected to local guides. Local guides aren't allowed to make money. The SVTP people are allowed to make money from their 360 photography and the tours they build for places, but they're not allowed to make money from putting places on maps or from um, registering businesses or things like that. That has to be kept to one side because that's more of a local guides activity. If they're Interestingly, if they're only doing SVTP and they're not part of local guides, they are allowed to make money from putting them on maps because it's not against the local guides rules because they're not local guides. That's okay. <laughs> The world's full of inconsistencies. Wouldn't be Google if it didn't have inconsistencies. But so we'll be talking, Max will be talking about inside and he'll be talking about that both from a photography and a little bit of a business perspective. And I'll be talking about making the street view blue lines. So how you can do that if you've got the right kind of device. Um, I will probably demonstrate how to do a 360 with a phone, even though it's... Um, or maybe I'll do part of one. I probably won't do the whole thing because it'll take ages. Um, you, you look a little bit like a, a ballerina when you're trying to do a 360 with a phone, but that's most likely the device that most people will be using because it's the most accessible way to do 360 photos without having a dedicated camera. And we'll show you a couple of those as well. So Max and I use different cameras. So you'll see the different ones of those. And Shreya says a ballerina with a strange audience. I don't know about a strange audience, but a strange ballerina. <laughs> so are there any other questions this evening? This could be two weeks in a row we're going to finish on time. This is weird. <laughs> Maybe people are running out of questions and we're not going to go for hours this time. Cool. Jason's Hi. just put into his site. Yes, Guru? Yeah, uh, this is not a question, but this time instead of lenses, you are having many Legos on the on your table. The little Legos, yeah. <laughs> this this is the um, new series, series twenty. Oh. I I did have all of them, but my two little nieces who are five and seven visited last weekend, and I haven't found them all yet. <laughs> oh. They'll be around somewhere, okay. either here or at their house, one or the other. <laughs> send something for us also do you want me to send you Lego Anil <laughs> okay. I'll see your collections that's one shop wonderful well, you can see a lot of it behind me in the cupboards oh, where I've got some new shelves for those cupboards so you'll, you'll see more in there next week mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that's in boxes is going to go into the cupboards, finally. Cool. All right. Are there any other questions for this evening? If there aren't, we'll wrap up and call it a night. No, People are no not here. Human are not so obedient. How your cat is so obedient, Paul? Which one? There's none there now. Depend <laughs> of it. The moment I wrote more uh, obedient cat, it went off. Of course it did. It's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if, if you want um, an animal to love you, you get a dog. If you want, if you want to be, a, <laughs> if you want to be a slave, you get a cat. There, there are six cats here. Christine's offering to go and find one. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Um, Anshuk wanted me to repeat the task. You're going to take two photos of food and you can arrange them and light them any way you like and just add your two best photos into the album. So if you scroll back up in the chat, I'll get the album link out. I will go and find it. There we go. And I'll paste it in again. 
and this time I'll post it without the name of the person from Connect that I was tagging before. Oh, look at Kim. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Say yeah. hi, hello. I'll, I'll get the one that I'll get the one that's not evil. <laughs> the other one's evil. This is busy. Oh, oh. Cozy, cozy. And see, she's she's being a typical cat. She's refusing to look at the camera. She, Go on. She's there. looking the one here. There we go. <laughs> cool. All right. Gorgeous, gorgeous look. Well, since, since there's uh, no more questions, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Thank you very much, for Jess and Max, for presenting. You both did an awesome job. Thank you, Paul. Really cool that you did that. Thank so, you, Paul, Jesse, and Max. Thank you for the session. Yeah. And we've got one last thing that we really do. Good, Paul. This is how we finish it up. Yeah, time for group picture. Yes, we do need to do a group photo. You're right. <laughs> close the chat and see if I can coax this thing into showing everybody. Hi. Hi, so, Yeah, I can see you now. So this is the time to take all of our photos. Hello. I still don't think it's quite everybody because there's 27 people in the chat and I can't see 27 people on the screen, but there's a yeah. few. Um, I can't use the plugin that I used to use to tile people because Meet doesn't allow it anymore when you're using a G Suite account, unfortunately. So. I guess can take it. There you go. So if everybody takes some pictures and pops them into the album as well, that would be really handy, actually, because you'll all be seeing different people in the chat. So you can all take some and add them. It's great to see your smiling faces. Cool. All right. So on the count of three, we're all say local guides. One, two, three. Local guides. Local guides. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And thanks to Jesse and Matt. Bye. 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 All. Bye. 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 Everybody. Oh, I'm Bye. feeling hungry. Bye. Bye. I've had dinner. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Good night. And I hope to see Bye. you tomorrow. Bye. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.